introducing or uh, reiterating about how church family uh, has so many different intricacies and life groups are a part of that that landscape of church families and again I encourage you if you're not in a life group uh, maybe find one we do an integrated stud study we've still got uh, today and we've got this week and a couple of more three more weeks after that to do our Romans integrated study hearing great feedback from those who are involved in groups tremendous to hear the encouragement coming through there and it's not so much well gee pastor Doug did a good job with the studies it's about what's happening in the life of the group, the discussions that are happening, the different variations. And I want to encourage you that uh, that could be part of your landscape as well as um, a part of our church family. Folks, you would notice up on the screen we have Romans, the next chapter of Romans, or it's part of Romans, sorry. We're going to read from Romans 1, 21 to 27, just a short passage, and then we'll see what God has to say to us in that. For although, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. For although, they, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over into the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degradation of their bodies with one another they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever to be praised amen because of this God gave them over to shameful lusts even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones in the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that throughout your New Testament, Father, there's that thin ribbon of grace. Lord, that things are exposed. Lord, uh, attitudes, behaviours are exposed and highlighted. But Lord, always there is that response from your heart. Father, we want to respond to your heart today. Lord, as we read through your word, as we listen to your message, Father, speak to our hearts, we pray. Lord, that we might be, Lord, closer to you. Lord, that we might sense your presence in our life, your spirit indwelling in us. Father, we thank you for this time together. And Lord, as always, I pray the words I speak, Father, won't be my words, but your words. Amen. The title of today's message, of course, is Choices and Consequences. Now, we all live with that in our life, do we not? We all make choices and there's a consequence from that. Sometimes the consequences are good and sometimes they're not so good. When we read through this passage of Scripture, we come to understand that Sometimes um, how we perceive God and understand God, um, others don't see it that way. And it begs to me to ask this question, is what does following God look like to you? So what does following God look like to you? You may be able to have a short list that you could draw up or you might have an attitude where you, uh, uh, you were ascribed to. Or you might have a philosophy. And then when this passage we have this, this understanding that God has said, well, I'm right before you, and yet people have turned their backs on God. How foolish. How foolish are they? We don't stand in judgment of people for that. We just understand that in humanity these things happen. And the next question we ask is, what does abandoning God look like? You see, folks, we have this, this juxtaposition, I suppose, or this this big cavity that's arising through this passage of Romans. And it's going to build and build as we go through the next couple of weeks. And it talks about how Paul is writing to this, the church in Rome and he's saying you've got to be careful where your allegiance lies, what you put in place as worship material. Because if you ignore God, stuff's going to happen. It's not because you ignore God. It's a result of you not ignoring God. When you ignore God, that is a consequence of your choice. And we live with the consequences of our choice. We're going to have a look at that a bit more deeply as we go. 
You see, when we make choices, sometimes there's an outcome that we don't like. Sometimes we want people to bail us out. Some people want, some want people to enable us and say, that's okay, you know, get on your bike, it's okay. There's a, a website that keeps popping up every now and then or a set of memes and it says, and the title of it is, Why Women Live Longer Than Men. Because men, apparently, are risk takers. They don't see the consequences for their choices. And when they embark upon bravado behaviour, you can see so many things wrong with that, can't you? No, who said no? Steve, good on you, Steve. <laughs> yeah, well, as Richard just said, well, where's his seatbelt? Because obviously, that, and has he got hard hat on? And I think he's even wearing thongs. So if you're going to fall, he's not worried about his feet falling under the lawnmower. Why women live longer than men is something we'll never understand, fellas. Because this makes so much sense. I can see half a dozen blokes here today who would have a go at that. <laughs> All under the age of 60. <laughs> or 60 included, perhaps. Last week we, we looked about, um, talked about uh, how we view God and our understanding of God and we talked about the glass being half full or half empty and how you see that, whether you see it as an opportunity to come close to God or whether you think God is walking away from you. This passage of scripture takes it a step further. There is no half glass, it's just poured out. They've just, the, 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 the people that Paul is describing are saying this is what we think of God and they tip the glass out in spite of him. And then they have the courage or the audacity to say, don't judge me. When we work with people and we're in their classes together and we come across them in our daily life, when we live our way a certain way, in a godly way, in the presence of people who don't do that, sometimes there's such a gulf in their understanding or the gulf in how they do things, they become self-conscious. When they become self-conscious, they start to look at you with some sort of uh, rejection or uh, looking through eyes of judgment, saying, don't judge me. We might, not intentionally, but sometimes we might correct them if they say something or do something. We may live our lives in such a way in a culture that doesn't drink, for example, that all of a sudden if you're in amongst a whole lot of drinkers, they want to know why you're not drinking. You might be in a culture where, where pornography is quite prevalent and when you, don't, when you own up at work that you don't view pornography, they say, what's wrong with you? See, when we walk with God, there's a difference in the world and that's what Paul is writing about here. He's writing about how... People have given this opportunity before God, which we read in a previous passage in Romans, and now they're rejecting God. They're not just rejecting God in, in a sort of a, a way of words, they're rejecting God's in actions. I don't know about you, but I look at the world and I think, how far is it going to go? How far is it going to slide away from God? We have a look early in the piece and it says these words, that they exchanged... Knowing God for other things. And folks, I need to point out here that the word exchange here in the Greek does not mean swap. It means change into. So people aren't swapping God for, for immoral and pure behaviour. They're actually changing into impure behaviour. They're actually making that choice that not only do we want to know about God, we're going to be so, our behaviour is going to be so abhorrent to God that he won't even look at us. And because of that, then there's a slide that happens. People go from knowing God and knowing the truth of God to living a lie, it says in Scripture. And that lie is not just a lie that tells a fib. It's a lie that leads people away from the truth of God. We live in such a world, yeah? We live in such a world that now that if you tell the truth about God, people almost accuse you of falsehood. And yet in our deepest part of our humanity, we have the potential ourselves to contradict God. And some of the things that we do in, in our lives, in, in our sinful nature that is only just below the surface, bubbles up sometimes. We feel like we've let the team down. And when amongst all these things that happen, there is the understanding that 
they, w- they went from worshipping the creator and serving the creator to worshipping things served and uh, s- worshipping things created and serving things created. In James 4.4 4 it says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? That means antagonistic towards God. Therefore anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Anyone who chooses to become a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. You don't think of it that way. We think, oh, we can't help it. The world's born into sin. We're born that way. But you know, we have a choice about our actions. We have a choice about our attitudes. We have a choice about how we interact with God and how we consider the things of God and his creation. And when we don't act accordingly in those ways, we're actually saying, God, I'm sorry. Actually, sometimes we don't even say that. We say, God, who are you? Because I'm more important. How I feel is more important. How I perceive things is more important. If God's going to change your life, you need to be aware of these things. In verse 23, it goes even further. It talks about idolatry. Now, the definition of idolatry is worth pausing for a moment here because I'm pretty sure most would think, well, we're not idolaters. We worship God. But in our humanity we can be in danger of slipping. You see, idolatry is the devotion to the maid rather than the maker. That's its definition. Devotion to the maid rather than the maker. And you say, what do those things look like? Well, that can be your job. It can be so important in your life you forget about God. It can be your family. You put your family before God. Now, that's counter-cultural today. It can be the position you hold in society or in, a, in an organisation or even at work that can take the place of God. It can be your religion. You know, it can even be your health. You can be so focused on your health issues, you forget about God. And that is what idolatry is. That is the basis. You may think that's a bit harsh, Pastor Doug, but that's the truth. And I believe God's message for us today is to recheck that. It's to say, what is the most important thing in my life? Is it God? I tell the story of when my now son-in-law asked for my daughter's hand, our daughter's hand in marriage, and we're walking around awkwardly around the truck museum because he made up this thing. He said, "Doug, can I have a few moments to have a discussion with you? I've got a question to ask." So I said, "Oh, let's go down to the transport to Staging Post Cafe and have a coffee." So I went down there and I said, "Oh, Rowan, would you like to go look at the trucks?" Yes, Doug, I believe that would be a good idea. So we stood up, unstaged, and we went in to look at the room. We wandered around, I'm teaching him all about trucks and gear changes. He had knew what I was talking about. In the end, I said, what do you want, mate? (laughs) And I knew what he was going to ask. And he said, can I marry your daughter? Can I marry Louise? And I said, it depends on the answer to this question. Who do you love more, my daughter or God? Then I walked away. Let him sweat. <laughs> I thought it crossed my mind to actually jog through the transport museum and make him chase me to give me an answer. <laughs> it didn't take him long, 0.5 of a second. He said, God. I said, that's a good answer. You see, folks, we can get lulled into this day and age thinking that things are more important than God, even the little things. Can I encourage you to examine that in your life? to write down now what is more just write the question what is more important in my life you know we heard about sue's mission trip just now to kenya you know even that is the danger of being more important than god because the whole mission the whole trip the whole organization can get in the road it's pretty tough isn't it sue you know like we went on a trip to three or four weeks ago nearly a month ago now and you know getting ready for it consumed my every thought and I thought, am I doing this? Is it how, you know? And God had to do some things to get my attention because our humanity gets drawn away. These folk here, they look like a horrible, abhorrent people because they've turned their, way, uh, their back on the truth of God and they've, they've exchanged, they've changed into something else that's not godly. But we walk that line sometimes. What is God saying to heart about idolatry in your life? You see, the ways of the creator differ from the ways of creation and the created. That is the truth. 
The ways of God, our Creator, different to how we understand it. The ways of God differ to how we can make sense of things. We need trust and faith. The ways of the Creator are so different and so far above us. But we need to understand that. We need to grasp that. And we need to be humble about it as well. In the history of Scripture, we have a look so many times at man's frailness. And, and you know, the example of the golden calf is just a great one. Is that while the tribes of Hebrews were all around the base of Mount Sinai, Moses goes up onto Sinai and he spends time with God and God gives him the Ten Commandments. I'm not quite sure how long he was up there. Some people might have a deeper understanding of me of it. Anyone? Thank you. I knew it was 40 days. I want to see where I was paying attention. Up there for 40 days. In that 40 days, this chosen group of people who were called out of Egypt and seen all these wonderful miracles decided, let's do something different. God's not here. Let's build our own God. And they made a dumb calf, a golden calf. Of all the things, like you, a bulldog would have been like, you know, or, or something else, but a, a calf? And they worshipped the calf. Eve in the Garden of Eden, when she had this opportunity to be lured away by the serpent, the lie that came through there was, you can know everything that God knows. And so she reached out for that. And then she realised she was naked. Attaining the knowledge wasn't the answer. The reality was there. And there's many more other things that happen in Scripture. The, 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 the fellas in... Uh, the, Genesis 11, they decided to be proud and say, we're going to build a stairway to heaven. We're going to build a tower. We're going to build this tower all the way up so we can be in commune with God. And so they set off in their endeavour. And as they built this tower, things started to fall apart. Their language changed. They ended up being dispersed. Because when people try to do the idol thing, it doesn't end well. Is there an idol in your life you need to deal with today? Has God spoken to your heart today about something? Oh yeah, I've been really concentrating on this. I'm sure God will understand. He does. He needs for you to repent. Because until we trust God implicitly, implicitly, we have a danger of drifting off and drifting off. The next thing that comes up in this passage is about the moral compass. And uh, we've talked about this at times, different times. Rachel and I talked about the youth group and the things that happen there and in society. I talk about the football club guys and the ones that I know that have their moral compass is broken. A moral compass, quite simply, is good and evil, um, bad and good. Sorry, good and evil, right and wrong. And because of those four areas, we have a way of stuffing it up. The moral, the, the broken, the compass, sorry, the moral compass was so broken that when Paul speaks these things about sexual impurity and homosexual relationships, that he's actually speaking to an audience that doesn't want to hear it. He's speaking the truth and he's speaking to an audience where the moral current is totally out of whack. And folk just don't know. In some research into history, I found this quite alarming, but is that um, the emperors of Rome had an interesting past. Before I go any further, I just need to point out the Greek word for homo means same. In the Latin, it means man, but in the Greek here in Scripture, it means same. So when it says homosexual act, it means same-sex act. Just want to clear that up. Make, just get a bit of Greek in there because it's always good to get a bit of Greek in on the side. Do you know 11 out of the 12 emperors, according to research, were homosexuals? This is the Roman people he's writing to. So the leader, the leaders of this community, of this nation, 11 out of 12 of them practice homosexuality. And so if the leaders are doing it, it must be Okay. Two out of three people, uh, th civilizations in antiquity um, and uh, primitive societies are involved, were involved in homosexual activity. 
don't know about you, but when I read this, I thought, oh, what? Man's basically good. It's only the really bad ones that go down the sidetrack. You know, it's a wonder that we consider today saying, thank you, Jesus, if the odds are stacked that much against us socially as believers in Jesus, except for the grace of God. When I read those research figures, I was abhorred and then I was heartbroken. Thinking of all the civilizations in the world that you read about in history and they were influenced just in this one way, how many other influences did they have? Folks, when we get so far away from God, things go sideways. Our moral compass slips. It might be a little thing today, but it can get increasingly larger if we don't come into obedience in Christ. You see, the absence of God leads to sin. It's as simple as that. In Galatians 6, uh, 7 and 8, it says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever, fl- whoever sows to please the Spirit, from that spe- Spirit will reap eternal life. Let me just read that first part. Do not be deceived. When we are deceived, we're lied to. Scriptures, you want to type into a, and a concordance, electronic concordance, type in, type in deception or deceived and you'll have multiple scripture verses come up. I didn't want to put them all up on the screen because we want to leave here before lunch today. Absence of God leads to sin. We can be so far from God, what is socially acceptable, or sorry, socially unacceptable becomes ho-hum. You know, Hollywood over the years have actually done an experiment. They started in the 60s by putting little bits of profanity into movies. Little bits of swear words and little bits of things that happened. And they kept it going over a period of decades until people started to think, well, that's normal. So they started to ramp it up. I read this in a Reader's Digest article, if it could be believed. And as they got more and more, people got more used to it, got numb to it, got accepting of it in inverted commas, then they just kept introducing more. Folks, the further away you get from God, the absence of God leads to sin. And it starts with one thing, us making an idol of our own selves before God, in our attitude, in our minds. And what we think is important before God, if that becomes too important, then we say, God, go away. When we look at society today, and about you, my heart breaks for the people who just are in that group in the middle who just, they're naive, I suppose, if that's the word, but there's people with agendas that are pushing hard and trying to break down society. And there's the ones on the other side who are saying, no, this is wrong. And there's the people in the middle who go, but isn't it okay if everyone just does their own thing? The further you get away from God, the great sin increases. The absence of God increases sin. When we left our own devices, and that's what happens in this passage, therefore God gave them over. God said, you vile, foul creatures, go to hell. Did he say that? It means he stopped what he was doing and said, if you want to pursue this, I want you to choose me. Can you choose me? Can you choose me today? Can you get your life into, into a relationship with me today? Is there something you need to say to me today? Is there words that need to come out of your lips to my ears in prayer, in repentance today? It says, Lord, I choose you because you've just pointed out in my life something that's become so great that it's taking your place. I can't lie any longer, Satan. I'm not going to listen to you any longer. I need to speak with God truthfully from the heart. Because, folks, that's what we need to do. That's how we come into relationship with God. That's how we put an end to these things. You see, when it comes to choices and consequences, it's about how we respond personally. We can be scathing of those around us and we can put people...
for those of you listening at home. <laughs> in Joshua, he was asked the question. He was trying to point out to the folk in Israel, the, 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 the tribes of Israel, we need to work out what we're going to do. These words are very poignant because he didn't just write these on a piece of paper and slide it under a wooden cross. We didn't put it in the back of his Bible. He actually said these words out loud. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve whether the gods our ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What a great prayer to pray. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Jesus said in John fifteen sixteen, he said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. See, when we're in relationship with God, we have that real sense of oneness with him. He chose us. We need to respond. And when we respond to God, he leads us. When he leads us, he takes away the fear and intrepidation. He gives us that affirmation and all we've got to do is just let go of that idol which is self-protection and step into his love and grace what we've got to do is just be honest with ourselves and say lord i've been hanging on to this too long i need to leave it at the foot of the cross because i believe that when i walk with you i will serve you to the fullest and i will find purpose and you'll find purpose in God. And that's probably the thing that disarrays. So I have young men sit in my room quite regularly and sit in that little blue chair. I call it the doctor's chair because there's one similar in my doctor's surgery. And they sit in that chair and they talk to me about their life choices. And they don't want to talk about consequences because they've lost purpose. When we find purpose in God, it changes how we look at things. I just want to encourage you with that today. Worship team, if you'd like to come out, we're just about to the end of our, our time in God's Word. I've got a few other things that I need to share. And, and in Acts 2, 40, it says, But with many other wo words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. When we make an idol out of anything, we become corrupted. When we allow those things to reside in our life, we become corrupted. And you could say, well, this is about the corrupt generation that's outside the walls of this church because the LGBTQXYZ movement has gone nuts and they've changed the face of our society. But folks, I want to say this to you, that you need to change in here to have the victory out there. I want to encourage you to get rid of the idol and to come into his presence. It says in Scripture, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Don't be part of it anymore. Some of the things we can do is pray for our society to be reacquainted with God. I know that Bob prays quite regularly for the leaders of the world that they might have peace. You know, Bob, I want to challenge you on that prayer. I love that prayer, Bob. The challenge is this, that they need to be reacquainted with God. Then they will know peace. They can actually stop their rockets, but they won't know God. They'll still go to hell. They can actually build a wall or don't build a wall near Mexico and they'll still go to hell. If we want to see a change in our nation and a change in this world, we need to pray that they be reacquainted with God. Because we've just read in Scripture what happens when you're not acquainted with God, when you choose not to be. You keep sliding to the right or the left or down or up or somewhere. You slide. Last point, if I may. In Ephesians 4, 17 to 18. So I tell you this and insist on it with the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles or the heathens or the barbarians or unchurched or people who don't know God. In the futile of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardened hearts. 
Have a soft heart for God. Have a soft heart for God. We don't want to be in that place where our heart is so hard that we think we know what we're doing when really God's just shaking his head and going, please, just look at me. If we go back to verse 21 for just a moment, I've got two slides left I want to share with you. I was looking through scripture, looking for the names of God, how you relate to God, how God relates to you. And I wonder if any of these are familiar or whether they're worth jotting down. Perhaps this week you can spend some time in his company, in his presence, in his word. And as we have a look at these, the first one is Jehovah Jireh, God will provide in Genesis. Jehovah Rapha, God that leads in Exodus. Jehovah Nissi, God our banner. Jehovah Shalom, God of peace. Jehovah Raha, God is the way, my shepherd. Jehovah Tiskinu, God our righteous. And Jehovah Shaman, God is the light forever present. Folks, when we get to know God, the things of the world grow strangely dim. Because we're in his presence and his light is so glorious. And all the little things that we do and the little struggles we have, can I encourage you this week that you put those into perspective before the God, our creator. Worship the creator, not the creation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that your heart is so large for us. Lord, you desire for us to be in community with you, Lord, in relationship with you. Father, we want to speak now from our heart. Lord, that examine us, we pray. Father, for those of us who have had idols pointed out, Lord, we need to bring those and surrender that to your feet. Lord, for those of us who have been affirmed, Lord, we give you thanks and praise. But Lord, we know that you don't want us to be static. Lord, you want us to be continue open to your spirit for teaching and maturity. Father, as we go through this week, Lord, just keep showing us your love. But Lord, just walk with us and guide us, we pray. In your name, amen.